Welcome to Podcast 5.2, Chapter 5, Section 2. And this is where it starts to get interesting because this chapter is all about ionic bonding. So imagine, if you will, you had these things that had positive charges. And then you had these things that had negative charges. Well, what do we know about opposites? Okay, they attract, right? And therefore, these two would come together in this thing that had a positive and negative charge. Think about a magnet. Here we've got a good old bar magnet with a north pole and a south pole. And if I put that up to a magnet that has a north pole and a south pole, if I bring this end to that end, they are attracted to each other. If I bring that end to that end, they repel each other. And so that's kind of the basis of ionic bonding is this oppositely attracting uh, thing. Let's see. So, as I just said, they are attracted to each other by their opposite charges. We just spent a little time looking over cations and anions. So when you bring a cation into an anion, uh, they are attracted to each other. And the cool thing about it is if we have these, let's say we've got these negative charges and these positive charges. Let's see. Positive and negative. They will bond to each other in a three-dimensional thing called a crystal. And so if you think about the kind of ion that sodium forms, sodium always forms a plus ion, chlorine always forms a minus ion, all right, they are attracted to each other to make sodium chloride, otherwise known as table salt. And so there's a really nice picture of a salt crystal. Don't know if you've ever seen one, but uh, that's a very, very nice crystal there um, of table salt. And this crystal over here, now, we haven't really gone over formulas right here, potassium dihydrogen phosphate, but just understand that this giant crystal here was made by the combining of positive ions and negative ions. And I've got a few crystals I'll show you in class uh, so you can see these on a, a more personal scale. So let's talk about this. Oops, I guess I just did talk about this. Right? So those guys come together in a crystal, all right? And then uh, last but not least, oops, not with that one. When you put these get together, um, they make what's called a salt. Now you guys know that uh, NaCl is table salt. And when we say salt, that's what we always think of, but really, uh, for chemists, and I've mentioned this in a podcast before, uh, the salt is a generic term for any ionic compound. So any time you put a positive ion, let's say I have a plus 2, right? And I put that with a negative 2, and we keep building these around. And we, we make it so that when it's all said and done, we have a very big crystal structure like that, or like that, we call that a salt. So any ionic compound is when you have a positive ion and a negative ion. All right, so now let's just kind of look at how this works. Now the first first thing that I want you to understand, and we're going to spend a little time doing this in class, um, is that energy is involved. And I O N I bonding. Okay, so imagine if you will, we had a sodium ion. If you look on the periodic table, you know that sodium has eleven electrons. There's two there in the first energy level, eight in the second, and then it's got this this s electron just sitting there in the, in the uh, 3s orbital. Here's chlorine two. There's an eight. And it has a total of 17 electrons. Well, remember, the driving force is to have that octet of electrons. Right? So what happens is that 
through a process that we will spend some time on in class. This electron goes over here, and then basically it's like this uh, orbital just goes away. Right now, look at what we have here. Sodium has eight electrons in its valence shell. It's extremely stable, extremely happy. And then look at chlorine. Chlorine has two, four, six, eight. Chlorine also has um, an octet. So if we were to think about what's going on here, we've got this sodium with a positive charge, and this chlorine with a negative, and they are attracted to each other, right? And then that makes table salt. So that's really what's going on in ionic bonding. The process of electrons being lost and gained, we will spend a little bit of time doing that in class with an activity. Um, but it is, it is an important process without a doubt. All right, let's move on. So the one thing about ionic compounds, and you're going to see a lot of formulas. I'm just going to write a couple up here. Let me write uh, NaBr. How about uh, K... Uh, K2S, um, ALCL3, all right? The ratio of anions and cations is such that the overall charge is zero. And what I mean by that is that if I put, if I have this ion, let's just say it has a positive charge, and I have this negative ion, but it's got a minus two charge, right? If I were to put those two together, Okay, would that equal zero? It wouldn't equal zero. Right, what do we need? Well, hopefully you're saying we need another one. Absolutely. So now look at this. Now, is that a neutral compound? Sure it is. Because, and this is where our algebra really comes into play, right? Two plus a negative two equals zero. Right? So we've got to have compounds that equal zero. What's the charge always on a sodium? It's a positive. What's the charge always on a bromine? Negative. All right, so that's a that's a neutral compound. What about this? Sulfur, look on your periodic table. What's always its charge? A negative two. Potassium is plus one, right? But look, we have two right there. So that means we've got plus two and negative. What about aluminum? What's aluminum's charge always? Plus three. Chlorine's always minus one, but look at this. We have three of them, right? So right there we have 3 plus minus 3 equals 0. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. Now what would you do if I asked you, this is, this is about as tricky as it gets. What would you do if I asked you to put together something that had a minus 2 and something that had a plus 3? Okay, How would you put that together? All right. Pause that for a second and just see what we you would do. All right, let me show you what was going on. You, the way you think about this is what's the least common multiple of 2 and 3? And hopefully you would go, well, it's 6. Well, what does that mean? That means I need two of those, right? Oops, I didn't want that. I wanted that. Uh-oh. Well, I'm going to have to write it out. <laughs> thought I was going to be clever here. So I've got plus 3. And I've got another plus 3. Okay. And then I've got my minus 2. How many, am I, how many minus 2s am I going to need to get a total of uh, plus 6 or minus 6? I'm going to need 3, right? So there's one there. There's one there. And we'll just put this other one over here. We're just starting to build a crystal. So hopefully you can see that that is a neutral compound. We've got... Um, 2 times 3 plus 3 times minus 2, and that equals 0, right? And that's really about as challenging as it would get right there, okay? Now, the other thing I want to talk about as far as ionic compounds, and I know I'm going fast, but that's okay because we'll spend some time in class, is some of their properties. And I have a few demos I'll show you in class about this. But here's some properties that uh, ionic compounds have, all right? They're very strong. And this is due to the attractive forces of uh, these two compounds. And what, what we mean by that is if you think about this, this minus 2 and this minus 3, or let's, let's just make two that are a little, little easier to understand. Here's a minus 1, and here's another uh, atom, or ion, I'm sorry, this plus 1. OK? 
Okay, and they're together there, right? Well, these attractive forces that, that are keeping these two... Oops. Oh, man, sorry about this. I hate when I, that happens. Let me try one more time. Plus. Plus one. Minus one. All right. There we go. So when we have those together, they're they're attached pretty strongly, and so it makes it really hard. So for example, um, regular table salt. Okay, you can't melt it. At least at home, you could definitely melt it if you had a Bunsen burner. But what about something like sugar? All right. Sugar does not have these ionic bonds, so it melts quite readily. Another thing about ionic compounds, and this is kind of what I'm talking about, they have a high melting and boiling point. And again, it's due to this attractiveness. Ionic compounds conduct electric current when melted or dissolved in water. right? And that is a demo I'm definitely going to show you in class. If you put them in water, or you put them, or you dissolve them, it can conduct. And I'm going to attempt to draw here, but let's imagine we have a cup of water. Here's my cup. Here's my blue water. If I dump in NaCl when it's a solid, and I put it in there, really what happens is I get some of this. Some of this. I get some Na pluses floating around and Cl minus floating around. Okay, that conducts. Okay, that actually conducts. Boy, I just horrible word on that. Let me try that. Okay, that conducts, and it does that because those ions can start floating around. But when that crystal is locked in like this. Let's say it's a crystal that looks something like this. Okay, When it's locked in like that, that will not conduct. Okay, So you've got to dissolve them or you've got to uh, melt them in order to get them to conduct. And I'll show you that in class. And then last but not least, ionic compounds are hard and brittle. Right? Um, a salt crystal you can easily break. And I'll show you again I've got a couple models that will show you that. This crystal, if you were to drop it on the ground, unfortunately, would shatter into a lot of little pieces. And the reason it does that is because all those positive and negatives, if I, if I bump this row just a little bit down, let's say, for example, oops, <coughs> excuse me, let's say, for example, I could bump it just a little bit down. Well, now this blue is next to that blue, and that red is next to that red. And now you've got, instead of opposite track, uh, charges next to each other, you've got uh, the same charge. And so it kind of helps it blow apart. So those are the properties of ionic compounds. All right. So with ionic compounds, I've got some fairly cool demos to show you about how this stuff works. These are the properties that are important that you understand. They're very strong bonds. The strong bonds give them a high melting and high boiling point. Uh, they're really good conductors when you melt them or dissolve them in water, but not when they're solid. Maybe I should write that. Not while solid. Okay. And then they're hard and they're brittle. I mean, a, a salt crystal, if you had that big one, it's it's it feels hard, but it's pretty easy to shatter. All right? So questions we'll answer tomorrow. I uh, hope this was a good one for you. Uh, see you later.